morning. What a beautiful morning. Thank you for all being here. Uh, today we are at the Tumwater Falls Fish Facility run by the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife. And we're here with the Stream Team program, which is getting ready to celebrate its 20th year anniversary this spring. So for 20 years, local citizens have been helping to restore, oh, the fish are noisy, <laughs> and enhance the areas around our streams and also to protect all of our water resources. Salmon stewards are a special stream team volunteer. They take both classroom instruction, two classroom instructions, plus advanced instruction, and three field instructions. The first field instruction is the Fifth Avenue Dam down in downtown Olympia. And then, like the fish, they follow up the Deschutes and come up to the Tumwater Falls Fish Facility. And then in November, they'll be out at McLean Creek learning uh, to teach about the chum run, which is actually a native chum run. So I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Debbie Smith. I'm the Water Resources Coordinator for the City of Tumwater. And as part of my job, I'm the Stream Team Coordinator for the City of Tumwater. Lacey, Olympia, Tumwater, and Thurston County each have a Stream Team Coordinator. And I would also like to introduce uh, the person who will be doing our speaking on the fish today. And that's Lee Pylon from Washington State Fish and Wildlife. Uh, as Deb said, my name is Lee and I work for the Department of Fish and Wildlife here at Tumwater Falls. And uh, we're going to go through and give you guys a little training on what you're looking at when you're standing up here on the breezeway or the sidewalk and you're getting uh, questions from the public. Uh, and hopefully we can get you some information that you'll be armed with uh, so that you can uh, inform them of what's going on and why we're doing it. Uh, and what for? So, uh, to make a, or to kind of give you a, a background for what we do here, um, starting in late August or early September, we uh, open up this trap and we prepare for the returning adult Chinook salmon and coho salmon that are going to migrate back into the Deschutes River to reproduce. So, we open up these traps or these two holding ponds. The fish come up through the Capitol Lake Basin. They enter the Deschutes River. They come through a series of three fish ladders, uh, which are on the, the lower system here. Uh, and that's the only way these fish can get up to the upper river uh, or up even to this point. Once they've made it to this point, they, as you can see, still want to go upstream. Now, we will pass a portion of these fish upriver to spawn naturally. It will also create nutrient enhancement in the upper river for the resident fish that live there. Nutrient meaning this is going to prove, provide a food source for small fish, wild animals that live along the shores of the river or the banks of the river like raccoons, otters, mink, things like that. They're going to feed on these animals, on these carcasses as well once they've spawned. Uh, and died. So once in here, for our purpose, we're going to go through and we're going to uh, harvest or take eggs from the females. We're going to take the milk or sperm from the males. And at that point, before we even do that, we're going to kill these fish. They're going to, to die after spawning. We're going to kill them first so that we get a better quality egg better quality milk from the male, it's easier to handle them, makes it easier for us, okay? So, with that in mind, what we would do is just like I have here, I've got fish collected up on this floor right up here. We would get in just like this and we're gonna go in and we're gonna get our hands on these fish and we're gonna look for a variety of different things. Prefer, you know, first things we're gonna look for is males and females. We're going to check and see if that male or female is ripe. Okay. So as we grab that, we're going to look at it. We're going to try and determine male or female. This is a male Chinook, probably four or five years of age, based on its size. You look at the snout, as long as you can hold it. I'm going to get it tired. It's going to be tired soon. This is 
not the same one, but. Okay, so we're gonna look at the snout down through here. Long, long jawline, more of a hook nose, very slender belly. This is a male, a little bit more of a high ridge in its back. Okay, male Chinook. This is a hatchery fish. We know that by the fact that the adipose fin has been removed. That identifies this as a hatchery male Chinook. And now, let's see if I can find a female. When you're looking at these things from up on the walkway, and people are asking how you can tell, you'll probably be able to, to tell mostly by the roundness of its back and its belly. So you look kind of for the ones that are a little bit more round through the, the belly section of the fish. Round through the belly. This one's still pretty firm. These eggs are still in its skein. Okay, the mouth much smaller, much more rounded in the snout. Same thing, hatchery fish, adipose is removed. Okay, there's your sh female Chinook. That one there is probably a three-year-old fish, three or four. So I said something about that female, the belly on it was very soft, or was still firm. Those eggs are still not individualized, and that's something that we would look for when we're handling these fish. So once the belly has softened, and that it's, it feels like it's just full of water, that tells us that the eggs have individualized. This one's a little closer. So we'll see if we can't get some eggs out of this one, just to show you. So if the belly is real soft and like it's full of water, and you can kind of tell because this collapses in here down by the vent. See, and that's with almost no pressure. So that tells us, that would be one way to tell that that fish is ready to to spawn or uh, give us its egg. So we would probably kill that female if we were going to spawn it. We'd kill that female. We would then slice the belly open, get all the eggs out of it. <clears throat> Just like that. They go into a bucket. They're shipped uh, to another facility. We have no, uh, currently we don't have any uh, incubation here. We don't do any of the incubation on site here. It's all done. Uh, at Minner Creek Hatchery in uh, Gig Harbor. And all those eggs are incubated and reared there. They're identified as hatchery fish by removing the adipose fin when they're about two inches in length. Um, once identified as hatchery fish, they're reared, they're brought back here in the spring and re raised and reared here for a, a minimum of 10 days. We try to get a minimum of 10 days on this water system so that they know uh, this is where they want to come back to or this is where they're going to come back to when they've matured like these fish have. Anywhere from one to five years later. Could be even longer. So that's kind of the quick. Uh, there's a couple other things we do. Like I said, we put fish upstream. You may see if you're here uh, during the week, if you happen to come by with a school group, and you see us out here, you'll see, you may see us with one of these. This is nothing more than a metal detector. We call it a wand. And we run this, we, we'll, every fish we get, we're going to take it and we're going to run it over the snout of the fish, just like this. We're going to check it pretty thoroughly. And is what we're doing is we're checking for coated wire tags. Some of these fish, 75,000 of the fish that are released from here are marked with uh, a coated wire tag. And we have to use that now because this is what we used to do is we used to take that coated wire tag, you'd implant it in the snout of the fish, and we would remove the adipose fin. That identified that fish as having a tag in it. But now that we identify all of our hatchery fish by removing that fin, we now had to go to the metal detectors to detect whether it had a tag in it. You'll see these, you'll see these out on boat launches in, in, in areas where they uh, are checking fishermen as they come in and they're checking for those tags so that they could get the snout or the head off of that fish. Uh, 
and then uh, be able to receive that information from that fish as to where it came from, where it was released, how long ago it was released, any studies that were related to that fish or group of fish. So you may see that around, you may get questions on that. Uh, we check fish whether they're coming out here for spawn. Anything that leaves here is checked so we can get that, whether it goes upstream or not. If we're going to put, put that fish upstream, we check it. If it beeps, that fish is no longer going to be allowed to go upstream because we're going to have to kill it and take the head off of it and turn the snout in for collection. Um, you're going to hear and you're going to get a lot of questions in regards to jacks. And a jack is still a Chinook salmon. Oh, that one got you. They're, they are still uh, Chinook salmon. They are males. And that's why we call them jacks, because they are always males. And I know there's one in here now, if I can just find it. Where did he go? So, and is what they are, is they are a mature male that has come back, they are mature and they will spawn just like the big threes, fours, and five-year-olds. The only difference is, is that it matured and came back at the age of two years or less. So it's really nothing more than a size differential. We use a portion of them in our spawning protocol. We do allow a few upstream as well. They are a part of the natural uh, process in these fish. So we don't eliminate them. Uh, we don't want a whole bunch of them if we can avoid them. But they do give us information in regards to uh, how well that brood, brood year or brood class, when it migrated, it got, does give us information as to how well or how well it survived on its out migration. So it does give us some information uh, as to its survival. But we don't, like I said, we don't want to have thousands and thousands of them. We just want to have a nice, you know, five, six hundred, no more than that. Um, now I can't find it, and he was just swimming around in here, too. Where'd he go? But usually they're going to be 49 centimeters or less. You know, they're going to be much, a little bit smaller. And you will see them in there. Sometimes they will get confused with the coho, or you might get them confused with the coho. The thing you'll look for is the spotting on the back. They're still going to have that little bit of a bronze color, and they're going to have the nice black spots in its, in their, in its back. That's how you'll be able to tell. The coho is going to be a, a more silverish in color, more dark green maybe on its back. Bright, shiny scales on its side if it's early enough. With the coho, all the coho that come back here are all passed upstream with the exception of any one of them that comes back with the adipose fin missing, meaning it was a hatchery fish. That means it was probably a hatchery uh, stray from out at the Squaxin Island net pens, and those fish would not be passed upstream. They would just be taken out of the system. So anything that comes back coho, if it's got the adipose fin present, upstream it will go, and uh, anything that's hatchery clipped, will be removed. Let's see. This looks like the coho right here, if I can get it. Notice the shinier color. Not as spotty on the back. Adipose fin is present. Okay. Also can look at the gums, white gum lines. You're not going to see that as well from the pond or up on the walkway. That's a coho. It is, it is right now it is being, it is treated as though it is a natural or wild run, even though it was, uh, it was originated from hatchery. Okay, now that question, sorry I didn't repeat the question first. The question she asked was, is the coho run here a natural run? So it, the answer to that is yes it is, uh, but it is not a true wild stock. But it is a naturally reproducing run of coho here. And that's a question you'll get as far as the Chinook as well. And the Chinook run here is technically a hatchery run. There's no wild fish. There was no wild fish because of there was no access into this river system until the fish ladders were developed and built 
in uh, the mid 50s. And then the fish ladder or the fish ponds here were completed in 60, 61. Uh, and then we were trapping here. And then we've been taking eggs uh, from these fish since then uh, for the purpose of uh, enhance, it's called an enhancement program. And that enhancement program is for sport fishing, commercial fishing, and tribal fishing throughout Puget Sound, coastal Washington, Oregon, uh, Alaska, Canada. So that's what these fish are being raised for. Our egg goal here, or our production goal to get, is just over 4.8 million eggs for this program. And sometimes we will pull eggs uh, for other programs if they're needed. Okay, and that's all put back right into this system. None of them are taken out of system unless specified uh, because the other programs could not meet their goals. We do, the question is, do we ever harvest the milt from the jacks? Uh, yes, we do. We use, a, we use a percentage, one to two percent in our spawning protocol. So if we spawn a thousand females in a year, we, we'll use 10, 10 jacks in that mix. Uh, but not, you know, we don't, if they're there, we'll use them. If they're not, we won't. But we do try to incorporate them as, you know, up to 2% up to uh, of the run. So uh, let me think what else I need to, to touch on for you. Um, you'll get questions about the facility itself. It's operated, the, the water is pumped in here from the river uh, using two pumps that pump about 1,200 gallons a minute. It's, it's fed through the floors, the water upwells through the bottom, so there's no waterfalls. If there's a waterfall, these fish would constantly be jumping at it, and which puts more wear and tear on the fish itself, beats them up, then, they, then they're more subject to fungus, things like that. So upwelling is how, uh, what we use here. It reduces the jumping, even though there will be days in here where these fish are constantly jumping, uh, just nonstop just meaning they're anxious, they're trying to get upstream, uh, trying to get out of here, trying to find their way upriver. Um, so about 1,200 gallons a minute on each side for water flow. Uh, we run, right now we're running mid 50s to upper 50s in water temperature. Uh, although this weekend it might go up a little bit to maybe touch 60. So uh, it does, because of this being a very small stream, it does react to uh, weather temperature changes pretty fast. How long does it take these fish to get from the lower falls up to here? And what is the boat that's down at the lower falls? Now, the first part of that, uh, these fish can get up here probably within, I bet they could make it up here in 12 hours, maybe less from the lower falls. Once they've decided that they're gonna, once they enter the fish ladders, they probably make it up here in less than 12 hours once they've decided to. Now, they don't all do it that fast. Sometimes they do. Just depends on the urgency of that fish uh, and the timing. You know, if the weather, all of a sudden the weather changes uh, and the rain, or we get some rain, the river comes up just a little bit, those fish will push a little harder and they're likely to come up here. These fish can move a long distance in a very short period of time. Typically, these fish enter the lake in, uh, boy, it was early August. They started coming in, maybe even late July. They started coming into the lake, and they hold in the lake for a period of time until they've started to mature and develop even more, and they're closer to being ready to spawn. Once they're ready to spawn, then they'll move out of the lake and up here, because these fish instinctively know that they only migrated out of here a short distance. So they know they've only got to go a short distance back up. So they can time it so they get up here pretty close to ready to spawn. You notice when I had those two females, one was ready to spawn and one wasn't. That one that wasn't is probably a week away. Then it'll be ready to spawn. The other one, it was ready to spawn today or would be ready to spawn today if, if we chose to. Um, so they can make it up. Most of them hold in that lake two to four weeks. So our peak of our run probably just entered the lake last weekend on that rain. And now those fish will hold in the lake. Uh, hopefully they'll hold in that lake until last week of September, first week of October, and then they'll move up. Now, weather changes, rain, high water, different things will affect those fish and they may, may move up earlier than that. 
Uh, and if they do, then they'd come up here, they may not be ready to spawn and would have to hold on to them uh, a little bit extra time and wait for them to mature and be ready to spawn. So, and then the boat that's down there is a pontoon boat with a large screw. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but it's got a big cone in it. And uh, that, when they drop that into the water, it spins. And it just sits there and churns based on the water velocity that's going through it. And is what it does is it traps and catches out-migrating fish that are migrating. We use it to trap out-migrating fish uh, in the spring uh, so that they can get an idea of count and survival on what's coming out. Primarily looking for coho is what that's generally used for. They've used, they, they, it catches Chinook, it gives us numbers. When we release a pond of fish from here in the spring, we take that up and we take it out of the water. We know what we're letting out. We don't need to trap it and catch it again, and plus it would probably flood the box, flood the system, and then they'd suffocate and die. So we remove it, we hold it out for a couple of days, let those fish clear out, drop it back in, and then he starts trapping wild coho again. So he can, he can, do, he can get data and information on that, and then he has, a value, you know, he has a number in which he can extrapolate out to tell him what his survival was. That trap, he estimates, catches around 30% of the fish that go out if he's got it set in the right spot. And he checks that by a means of dumping some fish up above the, the trap, up above the falls. They come down and they go through the trap. He knows what he dumped. He can see how many he caught and he figures it to be about 30 percent. The fish that we put upstream, uh, their offspring outmigrate uh, as well as ours uh, during that springtime. And he also can collect data on that as well. He can see the difference because of the adipose fin being present. He can compare their size to the size that we're releasing at. He can, he can get some numbers. We also have uh, biologists that go up and check reds on the system so they have an idea of how many. We know how many fish we put up there, so we have a pretty good idea of what the number of adults went up there was. And then he can kind of give us a little bit of information as to what their survival was. So we have an idea of what their production or how it will impact or the numbers that could potentially come back from that. About the coated wire tag and does it do anything as far as uh, geological data like range, where it's been, stuff like that. No, it does not. It is strictly just a piece of wire that has a numeric code on it. And that numeric code simply refers us to a sheet of paper that has information regarding where it was released from, when it was released, and any kind of study, whether it be feed related, release strategy, uh, things like that, dates it was released. So it's very, uh, very basic information. Uh, if we wanted to do something like that, is what we would have to do is put in uh, what they call a pit tag, I believe it is, or a, another kind of a, uh, a tag that it would go and it's usually surgically implanted into its belly and that tag then would go past receivers and they're starting to get a network of receivers throughout the straits and up along the ocean coast that would track and identify when these fish go by them and that would be how they could the only way you could really track track where they're at would be during the fisheries uh, if they were caught troll caught and they received any of those tags, they could say, well, we caught one of your fish, it was from the Deschutes, and we caught it up on the fishing grounds in Alaska or Canada or Gig Harbor or whatever. So it does, I mean, there is some ways, because they do track where the fish was caught, a lot, of the, a lot of the information is received back at the hatchery. That's where the majority of the tags are caught. But the fishermen, that's why I say it's important for those fishermen to turn those in to report where they caught it, when they caught it, to get that kind of information. So I mean it can work for that, but long term or better, better information would be for something like you know a tracking type tag, uh, but they're very spendy and there's not a whole lot of that going on. Because most of them just get eaten and you're tracking a bird. Yes? What fish are native to the Deschutes? What fish are native to the Deschutes? Um, there was probably some resident trout in it prior to the 50s. Uh, I do not have a real good answer for you on that because I don't know the history of it. I would take a guess that there was probably some resident trout, maybe some resident cutthroat. Um, after that, 
probably no, nothing that was anadromous, meaning going from fresh water to salt water, salt water back, because of the, the, the falls being impassable. So once these fish were introduced, then they introduced Chinook, they introduced Coho, and there has been chum in this system. Uh, we've seen pinks in the system, and we've seen sockeye in the system. No Atlantics. We take those, we make sure those don't go anywhere. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, I, you know, I, I, so yeah, anything like that. If, if you were getting a lot of those questions, let me know, and we could try and get some research done on that for you and get back to you. How far up the river do the coho and chinook go as far? The, the chinook, uh, depending on log jams, debris, things like that, we assume probably within the lower 15 miles, river miles. Uh, if it's wide open, they'll certainly go farther. Most of these fish, by the time they go upstream, probably aren't going to go much farther than that. The coho, if you're familiar with the system, they, we try to get them and they try to get up as far as, because they don't want to spawn in the Deschutes, they're typically going to go try and spawn in tributaries to the Deschutes, which is going to put you up into Little Deschutes and Thurston Creek. Uh, so smaller creeks like that is where your coho are going to try and get to, up into the smaller, smaller streams. When do we open up the trap or these ponds and how long do they stay in the ladder, right? So we opened it up last Friday. Right, usually we try to open it up right before Labor Day weekend, so there's fish in the ponds for people that are traveling or coming and visiting the park. We try to get fish in there. If there's not enough fish in the ladder uh, at that point, we may not because of the cost of running pumps. So we may hold off until after that weekend or until there's enough fish to justify running the pumps. So we do kind of watch it that way. This year we opened it up on a Friday. I figured we had a few fish. We might pick up 50 or 60 right away we picked up over 150 within the first two hours. So there was a lot more fish in that ladder than, I expect, than I, what I was expecting. And then of course the weather was changing at the same time going into that weekend when it got real wet, windy, and we picked up a lot more fish than I was expecting. So it, it just, you never know, you get the perfect storm, you get weather, then it changes everything. But before they move into the trap. They hold in the ladder if we've got it blocked off. Yeah, they're in the ladder because they're ready to move, so they're migrating. They're, they're just constantly working themselves upstream, and by using the fish ladders, which they're going to do because that's the least resistance, and then they're trapped, kind of blocked off there until we open up here. And then once we open it up here, then they fly into here, and then once they're in here. Yeah, ladders are always open. Yeah, and when we're not trapping, they're open, so fish can actually pass all the way through for cutthroat, different, different species. They're free to, to move in there talking more about the egg taking process, uh, when, how often, uh, timing, who's you know open to the public. So when we're taking eggs here, we take them generally on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We start at 8 in the morning. We're usually done taking eggs by 11 in the morning. And uh, it is, it's always open. The, it's always full of people. You may come down here, there's going to be school groups. Uh, there are five or six employees down here working. We're always here to answer. We can always answer your questions. Just kind of get somebody's attention. Ask the question. They should be able to answer it. Uh, so Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, we usually start right around the 20th. Could be a day or two in front of. Could be a day or two behind the 20th. So it's just usually right in that time frame. I think this year we could start the 18th. Uh, most definitely the 21st. Uh, and then it's every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through probably October 10th, as long as we have fish. We'll try and stretch it out that far if we can. Why do the uh, Fish and Wildlife employees take the scales? I see them taking the scales from the fish. The question is why does the Fish and Wildlife employees take the scales off of the carcass when we're done? The reason we're doing that is we're collecting data on those fish or this group of fish and is what they're doing is they're looking at the age of the fish. So by pulling the scale, they'll pull a series of six, three to six scales, they'll put it on a card, they'll write down the date, they'll write down the uh, length of the fish, whether it was a male or a female or a jack, and they will put those cards on there with that information, they'll take it to the lab, they'll press those scales out and they'll read them, and by looking at the rings on those scales they can tell how old that fish is. And that's what they're that's what they're looking for. He's looking at a fish down here, and it's a 
It's a large four or five year old male that still has its adipose fin intact. This one, well, I'm going to take a look at it because sometimes you can look at the, the, that adipose fin and sometimes if you look at it, it's kind of flattened off or something doesn't look quite right about it. But this one here is definitely a fish that was probably uh, came out of the river naturally. That adipose fin is nice and rounded. It doesn't look like there was any kind of an attempt to clip it. Sometimes they get clipped, the scissors don't get quite underneath it and have it completely removed, so you get kind of a flat spot in it. We would consider that a bad clip or a poor clip. So then you have some just, you know, then you got to look at it and say, was it or wasn't it? And that's always kind of argumentative. You know, there's some people that are out fishing and they really want to keep a fish. They're going to try and argue that a little bit. Um, that, I'm not sure that would be an argument I'd want to get in with a, so with a uh, game one. agent. Huh? The, natural, the question was, the natural spawning worked for at least one fish, and yes, it did. Now, we get back here, on average, each year, about 5% of the run. 5% of the returning fish that come back here have an adipose fin on it. So, the fish that do go upstream do contribute to this fishery. Uh, absolutely, they do survive. Some years better than others, but uh, they do contribute to about 5% what happens to the carcasses uh, once we're done with them and we're done with the carcass where does it go what happens to it the state of the the state of Washington is contracted with a buyer who comes in he supplies the truck the driver the totes and the ice he comes in here every day that we're gonna spawn or surplus or any of that and I'll explain all those things but he comes in and as we're done with the fish, as I say, we check it for all of the information we need. It then goes to him. He puts them in totes, either males, females, spawn females, females in the round, meaning the whole fish, uncut. Uh, it means the female with the egg still in it. Uh, we call them in the round. Uh, and those would be surplus fish. Males are the same way, uncut, unspawned. So they're all kept separately because each one of those fish is is going to be uh, coded and uh, invoiced or, or tagged differently because of what they can do with each and every one of those uh, fish. If it's a spawn fish and it's been cut open, they can primarily only use it for, uh, their primary use is going to be pet foods, fertilized, so they're going to grind it up. Once we've cut it, they've deemed that it's not, uh, they've deemed that it is not fit for human, you know, table food because of the, the clam. We use the same knife and it's, you know, they, they, they refer to it as not necessarily handling it in the proper way. So those are going to be primarily ground up for pet foods, fertilizers. Whole fish, they may go through and they may strip the eggs out of them, use the eggs for maybe overseas, maybe it's sushi, but whatever. They'll have a, they have buyers for all these different things. Uh, whole fish, if the quality is good enough, they could, you know, fillets, whatever. It's up to them, whatever they have a market for. But they buy those fish from us uh, for whatever the set contract is. I do not know what that number is. Uh, and I, I don't know if it's really important that anybody needs to know. I mean, I suppose we could find out, but I don't know off the top of my head. And I've never even asked to know what that is. And I don't know if it changes very much uh, at all. So once we're done with them, they go in the totes. We give them a, we give them a ticket for what we gave them and they take it to their rendering plant. They also use uh, some of those fish. Uh, they make a donation to uh, local food banks up and down uh, the West Coast, uh, generally Washington from here. Uh, but yeah, they make food bank donations uh, pretty regularly because of the amount of fish they're getting. Whether they're using these fish for that, uh, there again, depends on the quality, depends on whether or not they, they, they think that it's good enough to do that with. They get fish from other places that may be better quality for that, being coho or even Chinook from somewhere else. Yeah, there's a little jack and there's a coho. Yeah, I'll try if I can if I can get to it. They're 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 hard. They're like trying to catch a. Yeah, they, and they just they're always the last ones to come out of here. Always the last ones.
I'd have to take more water away from him. He's got too much of an advantage on me right now. Oh yeah. Yeah, he sh he shows up when he's he knows knows it's safe to come out. The pens themselves are about five and a half feet deep in the middle, and they're kind of cone they're kind of sloped from the edges, so about five feet on the edges down to about five and a half in the middle. Uh, 12 to 1,500. We could probably go higher if it was just for one night or whatever, but about 12 to 1,500 fish. Uh, about 3, total fish, yeah, between the two. Yeah. Question was how many fish could we hold in here? 12 to 1,500 per raceway. All the other fish that are still on their way up here are probably down in the lake, probably see a few scattered around in the river. But most of them are still in the lake. In fact, there's probably quite a few of them just sitting in the lower, right underneath the lower falls. They stack up in there pretty good. That's a nice big deep hole, good fresh water, uh, and they hold in there for a fair amount of time. They'll stage down in there for a week maybe before they move up. But the rest of them are down I-5 bridge, you know, they'll find deep spots, whatever deep spots are left down there in the in the lake, primarily I-5 bridge, and that's why it's a popular spot to fish. And you'll see fishermen fishing from the I-5 bridge up around the corner. There's a spot out there they like to fish. So I'm assuming there must be a little bit of a hole right there that uh, they hold up in. Any other questions? Okay. The question was, uh, the, they receive is, what are the white spots that you see on the fish? And is what you're looking at is an injury to that fish that now that it's in fresh water, it's not trying to heal those. And is what's happening is fungus is starting to build, and that's what the white is. A lot of times when they're first in here, you'll see it, when it first comes in, it's kind of pink, and that just means you can see the, the meat and the, you know, the bloody, little bit of bloody tissue there. And then is what happens is it starts to heal over with fungus. And that fungus will eventually just start to just get larger and larger and take over. And that's what happens up on the spawning ground. These fish sustain injuries and scratches and things like that on the way up through the river. And, and they're not, all their energy is focused on uh, developing their offspring, so eggs and milt. They're not trying to heal any injuries. They're not eating. We don't feed them up here. They're not taking on nourishment. So is what's happening is they're basically decaying fungus decay and it all starts to that's what just adds to the demise of these fish once they're done spawning yeah these basins here we fill one of them with water for the females when we're killing them these over here are generally just for uh, we'll throw carcasses in here uh, for surplusing just to get rid of extra fish and then they lift up and it just helps us so that we don't have to we used to just throw them in here and then we'd have to bend over and pick them up again throw them into another tote. So now this one here, we just throw them in here and then we can tilt it up, so it pours them out onto a table. And then there's a, a machine that we can run them through that, that takes the place of this. Uh, and it's a tunnel and it just goes through and if the fish beeps, it shoots it one way. If it doesn't beep, it goes over here. So it's a, R, we call it an R9500. It's just a big tunnel type metal detector. How do we get the fish from the raceway up onto this floor? I take this floor, I drop it all the way down to the bottom. It's on cables and it drops down all the way to the floor. I take this rack right here, I lift it up. I drag this back, I drop it, and then I shove the fish on top of it. Once I get this in place, then I lift it up. The fish stay up here. Now we're in here, we can get on here and walk around and we can handle these fish. So, very high tech. It beats nets and crowders and having to do it by hand. How do they get back to the river? If we're gonna pass the fish upstream, we'll wand it and then we'll come over here. We'll lift this up and we've got a, a funnel that goes down to a pipe that's charged with water. And those fish then get down in that tube and then they swim out and it drops them right into the river up above the falls and they're free to go from there. And we generally, you know, we may do that. I mean, typically it would be on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, or like I did just yesterday, put some up just to relieve some of the pressure on the pond with the warm temperatures, things like that. How much do the fish weigh when it's in salt water versus what does it weigh when it's here? Um, 
you know, my best guess is, is that when they're out in the ocean and they're just coming in here, they're still actively feeding, they've got good high fat levels, their body fat is up. You know, it's going to depend on maybe the size of the fish, but it could mean as much as five pounds in difference. Still going to depend on the age of the fish, but you're looking at average size fish here when we get them, probably 11 to 12 pounds average, meaning you're going to have some eight, five to eight pound, you're going to have the 12 to 15, and then you're going to have the, the ones above that 20, 18, 20, 22. Uh, we generally don't see much over that. that. This big male right here, if I were to take a guess just by lifting it up, that's probably, a, I would say, 20, 18 to 20 pounds. By the end of the season, they start feeling like they're 35. But, you know, by, you know if you were to truly weigh it, it, it's... And out in the salt water, that was probably closer to, you know, maybe a 25 to 28, somewhere in there. You know, as much as that much. They lose a lot of the meat. I mean, it really thins down. If you were to take an ocean caught fish and cut it open and bring a fish that's similar in length and cut it open here, the meat, I mean, it goes from this to, you know, it drops, it drops off. They're basically eating or surviving off of their own body for a, for a fairly long period of time, up to a month maybe. So they really build up knowing that they're coming back and they're not going to eat much. Uh, before they hit fresh water, uh, generally. I mean, they might even still eat a little bit in fresh water occasionally, but generally speaking, they don't eat after they've hit fresh water. But they will still eat in bud inlet, so on. So, Is that why they start getting A little bit, yeah. Just the, just the, just the change in, in the diet and then their body going through those changes. Everything's generated, and that's what's happening. They've, they're absorbing their scales or losing their scales, not regenerating them because everything's being focused towards generating those eggs. So the fry do eat fresh water? The fry do eat. Once the fry have come out of the egg, swam up, swam up out of the nest, and start live, you know, free swimming, once they've absorbed the egg, which yolk sac fry, once they've absorbed that egg, now the egg is gone, or the egg sac is gone, belly heals over, now that fish is going to start eating through its mouth, and it'll start living off of the nutrients uh, in the river. That's why it's nice and important to have those carcasses up there that create that nutrient. The fish that we bring back here, do we feed them? Yes, we do. We buy or we get feed that's manufactured specific for these fish uh, and we feed them on a daily basis anywhere from every hour for the whole day uh, to three times a day to maybe one time a day. It just depends on the program, the size of the fish. But yeah, they get fed quite regularly and they eat generally one to two percent of their body weight a day to keep them healthy before we let them go. Then we let them go and then they're on their own. So hopefully they figure it out. What do we feed them? It's a pelletized, the question is what do we feed them? <clears throat> and what we feed them is a pelletized feed that's made up of fish meals, fish oil, they add the proteins, the minerals, uh, different chemicals, or not chemicals, but different uh, ingredients that uh, are substan you know that are important for the you know whether it be creel whatever depending on what they put in that feed will also depend on how much that feed costs uh, so you can get some real high end stuff you can get some real low end feed it's like anything else uh, what you get is you know what you pay for is what you get uh, but we feed a pretty good feed and, and they seem to do very well on it but primarily it's fish meal is what the main that's the big part of it and then there's the additive, you know, they add all kinds of minerals and vitamins. And Are these fish producing as much slime on them as when they're in salt water? Um, I'm going to say no, because when these fish come in here, and if, once we start handling them, and if we were to take these fish and hold on to them for a long period of time and go through and handle females, say this was the only fish we got all year, and we had to keep going through them to get the right females as we go, but we kept saving the ones that weren't, Every time we put our hand on it, we strip that mucus or slime off the tail. Every time we do that, it's just, it's not being replaced. And pretty soon we've stripped it all off. Now that tail starts to fungus. Okay? And pretty soon you've got a bunch of fish out there with these white fungusy tails, and the rest of the body looks pretty good. 
Uh, but yeah, every time you handle it, you're, you're stripping that off and that's part of what causes them to start taking on that, those injuries and, and the fungus. We have school tours down here on our spawning days and we do have uh, barrels. We have one of a, a red or brownish kind of solution and we have one that's just full of water. The brownish red solution is uh, what we call, or is what the, the trade name is Ovidine. What it is basically is, is iodine, and it's used for disinfecting and cleaning all of our equipment uh, when we're done, or even between fish, or between groups of fish, uh, depending on what we're trying to do or what we've got to do. Uh, yeah, it's just a cleaning and disinfecting uh, as opposed to bleach. Uh, so we have to soak it, and we have it at a certain concentration. Uh, and yeah, it does look, it looks a lot like bloody water by the time you're done. And, so, but it is just, it's iodine basically, iodine solution mixed with water. New technology that we're starting to use uh, here at the facility in regards to fish handling and uh, the fish processing of, of these fish when we're, we're handling them. We talked a little bit about these bins already. Uh, the, what Deb was referring to was uh, some stuff that we normally will have mounted in these sleeves or sockets and they are uh, what we call uh, stunners, fish stunners, and it's a pneumatic uh, piece of equipment that fits on here. And is what we used to do is we used to take the fish, a guy would get it and he'd say, all right, this one's ready. He'd set it up here and there'd be a guy standing here with a big baseball bat or a club. We'd whack it on the head twice and we'd drop it in. Okay, now after a couple shoulder surgeries and sore shoulders, um, they found this or some people have developed this machine where you just take, the, take that fish, it's ready, you stick it into the machine and it pneumatically it hits a trigger point, it's got a piston head in it and it comes down and it slams on the head of that fish. We'll hit it once, maybe twice, and then we shoot it through and now that fish has been knocked out. Okay, you don't see it, you hear it, you don't see it. You can kind of hear it, but goes through, quiver just a little bit and then it's and it's out. Uh, and it's, it, it, re, it saves us a person from standing there. That means they could be in here uh, and it saves the wear and tear on here. Uh, the risk of a bat swinging, missing, glancing off of concrete. Uh, you know, I've seen guys swing and miss and hit their leg, uh, different things like that. To go back even further, they used to use a wood block fish would go up there and they'd hit it with a cleaver and it would actually take almost almost take the head off but it served two things it killed it and it bled it we used to be real particular we used to spawn a lot of fish and they still do in some species where they will bleed the fish first so that no blood goes into the eggs and so that kind of served two purposes back then but it also created a huge mess with all the blood so there was some issues with that and cleaning that all up at the end of the day and where does all that material go uh, and it, it, you know, it was so. This is much cleaner, a little less obvious, although if you're here you'll notice the kids still get quite a charge out of the knocking them out. It's one of the more, and then even when you slice the belly on the fish a lot of them think that's pretty, pretty amazing too. So. So it's, it's kind of hit or miss. Some really get into it and some really turn away from it.